You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. This Week in Futures Options streams live, so be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. That's M-I-X-L-R. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. For more information, please visit ftserussell.com, cboe.com, and cmegroup.com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody. That music means it is Thursday. It is 1.30 p.m. Central, 2.30 p.m. Eastern. It is time once again for TWIFO, This Week in Futures Options, a program where we break everything down on the futures options side of the fence. We're going to talk the ags, the rates, the equities, the metals, the energy, whatever is lighting it up this week. That's why you have to tune in to TWIFO every week. Listeners, my name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting, at least we think so, Options Insider Radio Network. Remember, multiple ways for you guys to get access to that content. Of course, on demand on pretty much every platform under the sun. So if you like to consume it at your leisure on your own schedule, there you go. If you like to get a little bit more engaged, you want to get the live, we have the plus for you. And then, of course, if you want to go live, plus you want to get all the other cool stuff, including all the exclusive Pro content, including our great Q&A with Scott Nations earlier today, earlier this week, I should say, as well as our Options Oddities show every Friday and a whole bunch more. Theoptionsinsider.com slash pro is the place to go. So multiple ways for you guys to engage with and enjoy the content. Remember, if you like what you hear, you listen on your platform of choice. Keep rating and reviewing. It really does help all those new folks out there who are discovering the world of options and indeed futures options helps them beat a path to the door of this show. And of course... We do love to hear from all of you guys and gals out there, so keep those questions and comments coming. Let's see who we're hearing from on the show today. I'm pleased to be joined once again by Virginia McGathy from McGathy Commodities Corporation. Virginia, two appearances in all oh, about six weeks. You must be doing something right. Well, I'm doing my best. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Virginia. It is time to kick off the show the way we always do. It is time for the Movers and Shakers Report. 
It's time to find out what's rallying on the light side and falling to the dark side at CME Group this week. It's time for the Movers and Shakers Report. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Movers and Shakers Report, the portion of the show where we break down everything moving to the upside and to the dark side over there at CME Group this week. If you want to see this report for yourselves, we tweeted out the folks over there at CME. Always tweet it out right before the show as well. So if you're not following CME, you can give them a follow. You can see the support for yourselves or if you have access to the premium version of Quick Strike. You can generate it for yourself. And Virginia, where should we begin our journey this week? To the light side, a.k.a. the upside, or to the dark side? Well, let's talk to the upside for just right now. You chose the light side. So we shall begin our journey there. Let's break down our top five movers and shakers out there at CME this week. Number five, again, I'll give you a little bit of a hint, listeners. It is a mostly upside, mostly green week. We could put together a bottom five, but that's kind of about it. Maybe a bottom eight if you really stretch it out there. So let's go to number five. Actually, it shows you how how optimistic, how much of an upside week it is, listeners. Uh, the Russell 2000 is up 4%. It's only number 11, so it's not even in the top five. Instead, our number five, our Bottom of our top five movers, I should say, is Eurodollars up nearly 7.5%, 7.41%, followed by Brent. Don't get Brent on the show too often, up 7.48% before you get all excited and say, hey, let's break down Brent this week. 892 contracts on the tape this week. So probably not going to hang our hat out there in Brent this week, followed by the perpetual mover that is lumber, up 8.5%. And then we go out to energy again to Arbob up 8.56%. A lot of close, close races there at the top of the light side there. 8.56%. It was number one to the dark side last week off 9.67%. And it does some paper around 5,000 contracts. I mean, it's not a ton, but at least it's, it's more than 892. <laughs> and then number one with an aggressive bullet this week. Once again, iron ore up 26, almost 26 and a half percent. It was number one pretty much to the upside the last three weeks. Uh, it was up 20, almost 21% last week as well. And yeah, I know I would love to parse it. I would love to break it down. Not really a, an option story to be told out there in iron ore, unfortunately. So it's in a similar position to lumber. It's moving a ton, but not a ton of options to really analyze on it. Let's go to the dark side now. What little there is this week. It's actually a, a tie for the bottom of our bottom five there, listeners. Uh, wheat off 0.79%. Uh, actually, as you know, wheat does some paper, so we could hang out there this week. 60,000 contracts, followed by the peso at number four, also off 0.79%. And before you get excited, hey, FX, I was excited too, but 215 contracts on the tape this week. So probably not going to hang out in the peso this week. Uh, then we got the ultra 10-year off 0.9%. And then we got the 30-year off 1.15%. We know they do some paper out there. And uh, number one is the old-school ultra off one, almost one and a half percent out there. And, Virginia, since we have you joining us on the show today, it's funny. You come on this week, and it's not a ton of ags in our movers and shakers, but in the previous weeks that they have been lighting it up. So let's hang our hat out there first. It's time to get our hands dirty exploring the latest options, trades, and trends in corn, wheat, soybeans, and more. It's time to talk ags. All right, everybody, welcome to the world of ags. You guys know where to find all this activity for yourselves. Go to cmegroup.com slash twifo, T-W-I-F-O, or slash twio, T-W-I-O. Both of those should work. Both of those should get you to our This Week in Futures options reports. Then go to that drop down there. You'll see a bunch of different choices there. One of them right at the top, pretty easy to find, is agriculture. Then click on that and we shall begin our journey there. Now, Virginia, I know this is your bailiwick. A lot has been happening in ag since the last time we chatted here on the show. So catch us up. What is lighting up your tape in the world of ags these days? Well, I think that what's important to know is that we are experiencing the August doldrums. OK, and that's why the performance, you know, all the eggs are kind of right in the middle. Nobody has really uh, liquidated all their open interest. So we still have some big time open interest, but everyone's uh, waiting. The crop's not quite finished and we haven't been able to start harvest yet. But we are in a, a particular uh, interesting point just this today, because tomorrow is uh, September expiration. And whenever we get close to an expiration and there isn't a lot of news to drive the market, 
what happens is you start to look at the open interest on these options and they become like the magnet and start pulling uh, the futures right to that price. And that's really what we've been experiencing all week. And that's why we're looking at corn at the 550 level. We're looking at wheat in the 730, 740 area, even beans, they drop below $13, but $13 a strike had huge open interest and it pulled that market right back. So now the you know everyone's just scrambling to kind of roll over their straddles, get out, start to move now towards the um, you know just to the harvest month when we have November for soybeans and December for corn and wheat. Uh, that all being said, you know everyone uh, in the U.S. knows that we are experiencing a lot of uh, hot and dry weather. Sometimes uh, too much rain, uh, not uh, any rain uh, enough west of the Mississippi. Uh, that's making things a little bit more difficult. Although I will say that somebody was talking about corn earlier and saying the corn west of the Mississippi is terrible. But I did watch that Field of Dreams uh, baseball game, and that those corn stalks were about 15, <laughs> that, 15 that feet That all looked pretty tall. good to me. I watched that game as well. I'm, I'm assuming they were all planted right before the game to look nice, but still. You're right. It looked good. It looked pretty good. <laughs> I almost said, what was that that they're walking through? Yeah, so uh, that just kind of tells you that you know it, it's a uh, you know it gets spotty here and there. Okay, all that being said, there's a lot of managed money that's still in the commodity market and in the grain specifically, and they're waiting to see if uh, at the end of the the crop year that we're going to have one more spike. And let me just say this: none of the farmers have sold anything, and uh, now we're experiencing these doldrums. And what's happened is the volatility has come way way down. Even the skews, the out-of-the-money skews have come down, but the open interest is still there. So there are some opportunities to do perhaps some backspreading or even just taking a shot that uh, the market might have one more push to the upside to try to take out the uh, the highs uh, before you know we really start to settle into uh, you know the harvest lows that we normally get into. Um, but that's just something to kind of to be looking at. We've got um, you know crude has been up. Of course, uh, we saw that. One of the reasons even that lumber is up is because it got oversold and then it came right back. And with the the logistics problem we had about six or seven months ago, uh, that got so many people involved in lumber. So even though it came down like, a, you know, it took the elevator down pretty quickly, there's a lot of people involved in the market. And so it ramped back up. And I think that's why we're seeing a lot of a lot of performance just on that level alone. I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to ask you about that because we have seen lumber you know this week it's it's performing but you know in months past it was it was outperforming bitcoin i mean it was just insane you know the meme going around was that dead trees were the hottest new thing on the planet forget crypto forget everything else it was all about dead trees and people were hitting us up all the time saying hey you know break down lumber on the show and it's never really been a big options story so it's kind of hard for us to parse but i was curious for you out there living spending your days mostly in the ag markets i'd have to imagine a lot of new customers we're beating down your door, asking about what's going on out there in lumber and potentially even trading it. And it sounds like that was the case, Virginia. A lot of new entrants to the lumber market these days. It truly was. And it's a, a clearly a supply demand situation. And of course, you know, we've seen these markets before. And, and when you have a when it's kind of a boutique market and the market starts to build some momentum one way or the other, you better get on board or get left behind. Uh, and I think that that's the, you know, that's where it's very fun to just like buy some out of the money calls or out of the money puts, but you, you need to be able to be nimble to get in and get out uh, just because the market, you know, just kind of flies around a little bit. And since the, uh, you know, since we've had electronic markets, they all kind of work like that now, you know, algorithms do have a lot of power in these markets and the momentum is very powerful. And even though we're, when we are talking about like the grain market, uh, some of these algorithms get in there, and even though commercials used to drive the market more than anything, uh, they are not necessarily taking a back seat, but they're not as powerful uh, as they once were. So all the uh, all the technicals and uh, options and risk management uh, tools are so uh, important right now. You you really uh, it's not it's not that easy just to go ahead and just buy some futures and hang on to it. Even with the farmers now, they're starting to buy some puts, trying to ride out the longs, but they're buying puts because they understand that these markets can move very, very quickly. Is there anything that embodies the old world and the new as much as 
algorithms out there slinging lumber, Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you love it if you're on the right side of it and you hate it if you're not. I mean, uh, that's, a, that, that's the kind of difficulty of it. But, you know, the only way, uh, you know, uh, high volatility is really risky, but that's where you have, a, you know, uh, the rewards are huge. And uh, that's where, you know, the real traders kind of jump in there. And I think that there's a, you know, there's a potential. The potential is big. And that's why I'm really glad that you list all the different uh, commodities out there and uh, indexes that can really move the market. And since the onset of in the late 70s uh, of all the options across the board for everything, it gives everyone an opportunity to play these markets. Uh, and I think that uh, that it's it's exciting, and that's why I, I, that's why I love your show. To be a brave algo programmer, I think to start diving into the lumber field. Not quite as many inputs as you're probably used to, and let's say an Apple or a Spy or a VIX, a little bit different marketplace, a little bit more gappy. Brave souls who are venturing out into that space, and clearly they are because lumber moving yet again. Have you guys? I mean, I know the options aren't really there yet, so a lot of you like to play on the options, but has all this tumult, I know from your inquiries, it certainly has engendered more interest, but have any of you actually dipped your toes into the lumber markets? Mostly, again, on the future side right now. Let us know. It'd be interesting to see. What do you, <laughs> maybe we need, a, we need a micro lumber contract. What do you think, Virginia? That'll get the retail involved. You know what? It, you know, if it did, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't put it past the market or even the CME to you know get into uh, any anything that's got that's a you know like a hot uh, commodity of some sort and, or that has a lot of interest. Uh, the CME does want to jump on it, and, and uh, you know, Bitcoin is the perfect example. They got in, and then they got the the Bitcoin Mini, and uh, you know, they're really making everything available so that you can get more participation. And that really creates the market and creates uh, some balance to it and uh, gives everybody an opportunity, uh, you know, to participate in it, whether you're, a, you know, a commercial or you're actually an end user or you just want to be, a, you know, a, a spec trader. Now, let's see what's lighting it up out there in the world of ags this week. Like I mentioned, wheat tied for the bottom of our dark side this week off 0.79%. So I think we'll hang our hat out there first you can find this for yourselves listeners go into the ag drop down go to grains and oil seeds that head on into the srw wheat you don't really want to hang out in the kc wheat not a heck of a lot lighting it up out there if you did that you would see that front future at about a 726 and three quarters wheat is actually it was off net from our show last week remember our this weekend reports start from monday and go through pretty much have just this week, as it says in the title, whereas when we look at our movers and shakers, we go back to the end of our show last week. So a little bit of an extra time frame overlap there. From the start of this week, wheat is actually up about, oh, about one and three quarters percent, about 12 and a half handles. So it has been a bullish week, even though net from our last show, it's actually off almost a full percent. And, you know, we don't talk, <laughs> we don't talk a lot about weeklies and near dated contracts, really. In the ags, that's usually the domain of the equities and some other spots. And yet, right now, about 65,000 contracts going up in the wheat and this week. And so far, about 42.5% of those going up in the SEP contract that has a whopping one day to go. <laughs> so a lot of near-dated paper going up out here in the wheat this week. Let's scroll a little bit farther out to see if we can find something that has a little bit more meat on the bone here. Tell you what, we'll go out to December because that did about 24%. So roughly a quarter of the paper going up out there in Dece. That future at about a 740 and three quarters. If you're wondering, the vol out there, you know, people have been saying for a while, oh, you know, equity vol is in the teens and looking farther afield for volatility. I've been saying for a while, you know, you could do worse and maybe take a glance at the ags and wheat is holding it up here at about 28, almost 29, about 28.80, up about a point out there on the week. Uh, skew wise, we have the puts last week were two and a half percent rich, so two and a half percent bid over that nearly twenty nine percent, which is of course the at the money vol. This week, the puts have come in dramatically; they're seven point four percent cheap to the at the money, so crushing the puts. The calls last week three point eight percent bid. This week seven point two percent, so lofty bid to the calls, crushing the puts. Interesting, interesting, big move out there in the skew this week in terms of. The action, remember I said this future is at about a 740 and three quarters, so shy of the seven half level out there. And we're looking at the most active contract, seems like across the board this week, listeners, 
Everyone likes the 800 call. That's pretty much the most active contract in December, the most active contract, it looks like November here, the most active contract here in October, 800 calls across the board. They did, let's see, in Dece, about 3,000 contracts. Now, they're actually technically beaten by about 95 contracts by the 730 calls going out tomorrow in September. But we'll, we'll move away from those for a second because I said those are going out tomorrow. It said about 3,000 of these 800 calls in December lighting it up. That was the other most active trade, kind of tied for the top spot this week. The most active day was Wednesday, about 1,000 going up, slightly closing, about 800 on Tuesday, and the rest kind of scattered throughout the week. Looks like a lot of back and forth on this 800 strike throughout the week. Uh, let's see. Also, looks like, again, the 800s are pretty active here in October as well. Let's look really quickly, see what the 800, about 2,500 going up out there. So 800, definitely the strike du jour this week. Uh, most of that today, 1,600 of those going up today, 700 on Tuesday. The rest kind of scattered throughout the week. Obviously, we don't know the OI change there because most of that's going up today. But intriguing, 800 strike was where the action was this week. Virginia, is that what you expected or is that kind of surprised you? And anything else lighting up your tape in the world of wheat this week, madam? Well, that's kind of what I expected. I think the old analysts were had talked about this a couple of months ago about what what were what would be the upside objectives. Now, of course, we're not going to get ridiculous to say, okay, twenty dollar beans, you know, uh, twelve dollar wheat. Uh, those were numbers from back in two thousand and twelve. But the numbers they were looking for was fifteen dollar beans, seven dollar corn, eight dollar wheat. And what's happened is in these last couple of months, there's been a buildup in open interest. And right now, the open interest in the December wheat $8 calls is 10000 And that's the highest open interest of, of uh, all the strikes for December. So that gives you an idea that people are, people are starting to gauge on where they think these prices could go and very possibly start to you know, get, you know, get things moving in that direction. Um, I know that uh, there's, we're kind of waiting to get September off the board right now. And we're, you know, trying to get through these August doldrums, but uh, don't fall asleep because in the grain market, the market can move very, very quickly. And uh, kind of like there's a, a, a shock effect with the volatility. And I think it moves much, uh, you know, much faster than the equities right now, even as, you know, as high as they are. Yeah, just know that like just a month ago, the uh, volatility in corn was 50 percent. Wheat was right behind it. Now, we've come down quite a bit. And of course, we get, you've got wheat at 29 uh, percent, which is historically very high. But it is you know, well off the highs that we just had about a month ago. So that makes it kind of difficult to say, well, is it time to kind of backspread now? Or is this thing going to, you know, is it going to sink uh, a little bit further? And of course, you know, there's a little bit of room there for it to do that. But um, I think that, you know, I won't count anything out right now because it's, uh, because just the way the weather is and the way the crops are, everything that's going around in the world, uh, the extreme is the norm. And if you look at that, uh, that will give you uh, just the idea that, you know, like anything can happen. Uh, certainly today with the, the trouble uh, in Afghanistan, I think that that kind of put the market on hold a little bit and it just kind of froze the uh, the commodity market here. We've got that expiration uh, tomorrow, but I think that we're going to start to uh, ratchet back up again and get everybody back in there. Uh, uh, you have to think that uh, the commodity market, this is the food of the world. And while COVID has slowed everything down, uh, there's going to be some major demand expansion globally. Uh, that's going to really, I, I think, going to pull and open these markets wide open. And we're, we're going to have some a big, uh, a lot more gyrations that we have seen uh, lately. And of course, it's difficult to uh, compete with the, uh, you know, with the uh, S&Ps, with the stock market right now. If that starts to slow at all, you're going to see a major expansion in commodity markets and specifically in the foods. Interesting. So more action on the horizon for the ags, Virginia. You called it here yes. first. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you know, usually I let these questions wait, but this is someone coming in from the live chat. We like to bump the live listeners up whenever possible. And he has a question about ag, so might as well get it in now. Nichols wants to know, how are the fires impacting the new crops and the harvesting of the old crops? And you were joking earlier, Virginia, about the field of dreams. Obviously, that's, that's out west of here in Iowa and even farther west, of course, we're hearing horrible stories of raging wildfires. Our listeners want to know, how is that impacting the harvesting of the old crop and the planting of the new crop? 
Well, it is having a huge impact on it. The fires and everything really west of the Mississippi, uh, the fires in uh, in uh, northern U.S. and even in southern Canada is a, is a real issue. And I think that what's happening is the the hot weather and these fires. We've we've been experiencing a little bit of like trading fatigue, and uh, everyone's thinking, well, it's kind of digested in the market right here. Uh, specifically, uh, it looks like. Uh, we're going to have much less, uh, you know, yield uh, out in the the fire area or in the area that's just hot and dry. I mean, we still have we have hundred degree weather here in in Chicago, for goodness' sake. So out in the fields, it's just really you know killing a lot of the crop. But the difference is is that in some of the other areas on the east side, they're in uh, uh, you know east of the Mississippi or in the east uh, states of the U.S., they're able to you know, really um, mitigate that problem by growing, you know, the, the seeds these days and, you know, all the techn- uh, technology in grains, you know, they grow, you know, it used to be years ago that it was only one ear of corn on a stock. You know, now, now you have four or five. So, and, and then of course we saw the field of dreams, right? <laughs> um, and it, that, that can, can produce a lot. That all being said, as demand picks up, and this is why our markets are as high as they are, when China last year bought almost our entire crop of soybeans, that just lets you know the uh, the gravity of how much you know uh, China or you know other you know outside uh, buyers can come in and really uh, take everything that we've got. And of course, farmers want to sell it; they want to sell it at these high prices, but that will create, you know, uh, a squeeze in the market. A squeeze in the market means uh, way higher prices in the futures. And what does that do? That explodes volatility in options. That explodes the skews. And if you're a trader, that's that's plenty of action and to participate in and, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, get, get some big rewards. Well, speaking of big moves and big rewards, a lot of people had a lot of rates on the brain this week, and they still do. So I think we'll hang our hats out there. Next, the Fed, the yield curve, inflation fears. How are they impacting options activity and volatility in your favorite interest rate products? Let's find out as we explore the world of rates. All right, everybody, welcome to the world of rates. You know, listening to the show is my favorite complex. We hang out there all the time. <laughs> I'm just joking. Whenever Mr. Rhodes is on the show, though, he does try to lure me to the dark side of rates more often, but it's kind of inescapable this week, listeners. In fact, a lot of the volatility we saw towards the latter portion of last week in equities could be directly related back to some of the concerns over the Fed tapering. And then, of course, we have Powell giving another speech where people are planning him to give a little bit more insight into that coming up tomorrow. So not surprising, we saw a lot of rates dominating our movers and shakers report this week. We had the ultra 10 year and 30 year, of course, and the ultra bond there on the dark side. We had euro dollars there on the upside. So a lot to unpack. Now let's go out to Virginia as well. And I know when you're not fielding calls about the field of dreams, Virginia, I know you have folks calling up about the rates these days. They have been moving quite a bit. Powell and his folks over there at the Fed have been doing their darndest to inject a little bit more consternation out there into the markets these days, at least from the hints they're dropping. That's certainly what they're doing. What's been lighting up your tape and what are your clients calling up about these days out in the rates complex? Well, I think that they're kind of uh, they're just concerned about, you know, what that's going to do with uh, all the markets. You know, everyone asks, well, what do you think is going to happen and what should I do? <laughs> go, OK, uh, I said, if I knew that for sure, you know, I'd, uh, I might be out on an island in the Bahamas. Well, I will say this, that certainly from the commodity side, uh, the 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 talk from the feds has really put a lid on them on the market. And it, it's really like kind of stalled it out from actually starting to rally. Even even though we've been talking inflation, and I think that the the grain market has been really inflationary for the past year, and no one's really talked about it because the stock market's been going crazy. Uh, but I, I will say that um, you know, with the strong U.S. dollar, that really kind of hurts the market. And I think the uncertainty of it all, uh, everybody is thinking about. Well, you know, if they're going to taper it now, later. Will it really have an effect on the market? And I, I feel like that it's already kind of digested into the market already. So, you know, uh, it's only going to be surprises that will move the needle. And then 
when the needle gets moved, it really is just for a little while until everyone's trying to project into the future so much um, that uh, you, you've got uh, it, it's got everybody kind of like jumping the gun a little bit early. It's a little bit like, uh, you know, running these long races that they go, oh, my God, the pace is set so fast. Well, that's a little bit what's kind of happening now uh, in all the markets and even now uh, and specifically even with the. Uh, with the green market and with some of the other markets, everyone's pushing out what their ideas or what their projections are out to 2022 already. People are already talking about what's the harvest going to be in 2022, and we haven't even got uh, this harvest out of the ground yet. So um, I think that you know that's going to be it's going that's going to be such a difficult call because you're going to get everybody in the market. The beauty of that, from our standpoint, is that the more people you have participating in the market, the more fluid the market becomes, and then you know, everybody hangs on all the all the uh, technical numbers, uh, anything uh, uh, fundamental coming out. Certainly, where is the managed money uh, going? You know, everyone's trying to they have to you know, they have their rules and regulations they have to go by. And then uh, certainly, you know, speculators jumping in and jumping out really uh, start to uh, start to push these markets uh, really all over the place. Yeah, people have much more longer term focus these days, which is interesting, which is why maybe the 30 year is popping up onto our radar. We haven't had a chance to look at the longer end of the yield curve in a while. So maybe let's hang out there next. It's always fascinating to see what's what's going on a little bit farther out past all the noise and drama that's bouncing the front end of the curve around. See what folks are doing out a little bit farther out down the curve coming into showtime. We see the 30 year. By the way, you can find this for yourselves, listeners. Take that drop down, get out of the ag, go on out to the interest rates complex and then U.S. rates. And then you'll see the 30 year right there. Click on that and you're off to the races here. You'll see that front future at about 164, almost even out there off about one little over one percent on the week here pretty much in line with about the numbers we were quoting from the end of our show last week there and in terms of the action looks like 41 percent of it coming in the october contract even though surprisingly a hefty amount of paper 35 percent also going up in the sep contract that's going out tomorrow so one day to go there obviously a lot of closing paper but still that's a lot of near day to paper for the 30 year you don't often see that we're going to hang our hat out there in october 41% 41% of the paper going up out there. Uh, let's see. Coming into showtime, again, 30-year not known to be a bastion of high volatility. Still, it's closing in on a 9, 880 or so, up ever so slightly this week. So an almost 9 volatility. That's nothing to sneeze at in the 30-year. <laughs> you get in some other portions of the curve. You're talking 3 to 6 range. So almost a 9, that's actually not bad. Uh, in terms of skew, last week we saw the puts at about 2% bid to that already decently high almost of a nine level <laughs> on the at the money ball this week the puts have come in a bit they're about one percent bid to the at the money last week the calls were cheap four tenths of a percent this week six tenths of a percent rich so they swung the other way uh, which is interesting out there it's a little bit of a bid emerging for the calls if ever so slightly and in terms of action the number one contract remember i said we're at a 164 on that front future if you go on out to october it's at about a 162 and change. And so not surprising that it's the 160 put that is leading the dance out here this week in October, listeners. 27, almost 28,000 of those on the board. By the way, if you're wondering how much paper the 30 year does, about 427,000 contracts exactly on the tape as of a few minutes ago. So a pretty active contract, and obviously more numbers going up this week. 27, almost 28,000 of these 160 puts going up. The lion's share was yesterday, nearly 17,000. Of that slightly biased towards closing. So actually a lot of back and forth there in that 17,000. Nearly 10,000 going up today as well. So you're talking yesterday and today. You got almost all of that 27, almost 28,000 went up yesterday and today. You got about 1,100 or so scattered amongst Monday and Tuesday out there. So all the action in the latter portion of the week out there. Right behind it also were the 163 puts. They did 30 contracts less, 27,963 to be precise. A similar pattern there as well. Yesterday was a big day, 19,300 going up yesterday, about almost 6,000 today, and the rest scattered throughout the week. A little bit more bias towards the opening front there yesterday, though, of that 19,300, almost half, 8,001 to be precise, uh, were opening yesterday. So a little bit more opening paper on the 163 puts than we saw on the 160s. That's interesting, but a lot of action. You pretty much have a hefty put strip in October was leading the dance here 
this week. Y'all saw the 161s, nearly 26,000. And again, of that 26,000, 21,753 went up yesterday. And 15,000 of that was opening. So a lot of opening put paper yesterday here, pretty much across the board here in October. Let's look really quickly to see if we see any other aberrant prints out here. Again, a lot of action going out this week as well. 165 calls were the name of the game on the SEP contract. Those nearly 22,000 of those, again, those are going the way of the Dodo tomorrow. Uh, the big day was yesterday, about 11,000 and about 6,000 on the tape today. So near dated calls and then longer term puts seem to be the order of the day out here. Uh, Virginia, you get a lot of calls these days out there on the 30 year. And if so, what's been lighting up your tape out there? Uh, well, sometimes, uh, sometimes we get a little, uh, uh, you know, interest into exactly like what's going on with that. Is that going to be a little bit of a tell as to, you know, where the market's going? But uh, clearly with what's happening with the Fed, uh, everyone is worried about uh, the debt. And of course, when you see the bond prices at, you know, like 30 years specifically at 164, it just seems to be an astronomical uh, number. And that's why volatility at uh, at nine percent is not a surprise, just because it's get, it's gotten so expensive. So sometimes it's kind of hard to to gauge. Uh, although everyone has to use these options to kind of protect themselves in uh, with uh, with all all the managed money, with all your uh, you know uh, all your investments. Uh, I, everyone's kind of like thinking that, well, maybe we, we kind of got to the tippy top here and we might just start to slip a little bit. Uh, but I, I have to say this, that every time we think about that, it, everyone who started to bet against it kind of like didn't do well. So, so I just tell them, just be very careful and be nimble. This isn't a thing that you're going to just invest in and, and walk away and forget about because, uh, uh, we've got, we've got a lot of action in these markets and, uh, certainly in the bond market right now, uh, with, the the way the yield curve is, uh, you know, it can move uh, so quickly with everything that's going on in the country. Think about this. We, you know, we have uh, uh, if the feds, you know, decide they, they come back and decide uh, next month. OK, well, we've made, we've had a change of heart. Uh, we're going to start to raise the rates and we're going to start to do things like that. And now all of a sudden it'll just be a major scramble across the board and certainly across all of, uh, you know, uh, all of the bond markets and. Uh, I, I think that uh, it, it, w- it w- might create a scare for everyone. Well, the Fed has certainly been scaring a lot of people, not just in the rates complex, but as you mentioned, also in the equity. So let's hang our hat out there next. It's time to explore the volatility swings, skew changes, and hot options trades in your favorite indices. It's time to talk equities. All right, everybody, welcome to the equities, a portion of the show where we break down all that action on the vol and on the equity side of the, of the space. Uh, you guys know where to go if you want to find this for yourselves. Go back to that drop down, uh, go up to equity indices. We're going to hang our hat out there in the Russell 2000 first. And by the way, you're talking equities, of course, the flip side of that coin is volatility. And we had a lot more of it on the tape this time last week than we do today, though, of course, uh, today's sell off mitigating that somewhat. And We'll see if this continues and see what Powell says tomorrow. We may have more ball back on the tape tomorrow. We shall see. But as of today, coming into showtime, we had RVX, which is, of course, the VIX of the Russell 2000 at about 25 and a half. So back down below, but we just a tick north of the 30 handle last week. Listen, on the heel of all the sell offs and the concerns over tapering, we saw small caps getting bid. Ball was bid pretty much across the board. So RVX giving up the 30 handle, but not retreating too far back to the mid 20s. It's not like it's threatening the 20 handle again. And again, if today's uh, activity is any bellwether, we may see more of that 30 handle before we see a 20 handle again. Uh, VIX cash coming into showtime was a little bit north of the 18 handle, about 18.15. That puts it down almost three and a half handles from this time last week. Remember, we had some lofty ball on the tape last week. VVIX, which is the volatility of volatility. Remember, that listen to that number, listeners, when we're asking you for our other polls and questions of the weeks about what's more volatile, this product or that product. Remember, when we throw VIX out there, that's actually the volatility of VIX itself. So pretty volatile beast at about a 114, almost a 115 today. That's still off 15 handles almost exactly from this time last week. We were hanging out around 130 last week. That tells you how volatile volatility is these days. Vol Q, which is the at the money vol of the NASDAQ 100, a little bit north of a 16 handle. That puts it down almost four points 
from this time last week. That puts that VIX to RBX spread, so the large cap to small cap ball spread at about seven, almost seven and a half handles, about 7.4. That's a little bit over a point wider than this time last week. And the VIX to ball Q at about a two. So that's the NASDAQ, the S&P 500 ball uh, spread, about half a point wider. Speaking of ball Q, actually, we had Scott Nations on our pro Q&A session earlier this week. He's, of course, the creator of Vol Q out there. He tweeted out this right before the showtime. He's been watching this ratio as well. He said the Vol Q to VIX ratio is in the lowest historical decile. That's a trading opportunity here to spread Vol Q futures at CME versus VIX futures. He did also drop some hints if you were listening to that pro Q&A. If you are in the secret club listeners, if you're not, check out theoptionsinsider.com slash pro as the place to go for some great Q&As like we had with Scott Nation's. Of this week, he did drop some hints about the opportunity for some vol Q options coming. He thinks before the end of this year. So all of you who would love to trade that spread, I should say, using the options, you won't be stuck with the futures for long. Hopefully the options coming soon. So a lot of action out there on the equity and on the volatility front. I know uh, Virginia, when your phone's not ringing off the hook about all things ags, probably getting a lot of calls about equities and volatility these days. What's been light up your tape in that complex lately? Well, there was just a talk. I think there was a surprise, uh, the surprise comeback in the stock market as a whole. You know, there were uh, get calls about the ES. They're, they're like, hey, you know, uh, what happened here? We thought that the sell-off had begun. I said, yeah, you, you got to be careful with that sell-off. And of course, even this week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we've had, we've made a new high every single day except today. A little bit of a sell-off, but I think there's some outside influences in this market here. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we turned around and even made another new high uh, tomorrow. It's just too difficult to bet against this market right now, uh, and that's why you're seeing like the the, the put skew is just uh, you know astronomical, and that's you know that's just the nature of the beast here. Uh, now that being said, uh, there are some there are some opportunities out there. I mean, I, I, I know you know doing uh, you know writing covered calls in any of the stocks that you have. I mean, th- th- those are you know those are pretty solid. I think that you'll be able to just you know kind of grind it out and kind of take it in. Uh, right now, it's uh, the market's basically going one way, and I think that you, even though we we pull back, you know a you know a hundred handles even. Uh, in in the uh, in the S and P's, it's almost like nothing uh, anymore. So it's almost difficult to get your head around the how uh, the how the markets move, and that's why options I think are even more important to trade uh, even than the futures. You you can really manage your risk a lot better, and watching out for that, you know, to kind of uh, looking at the market, you decide on uh, what you think uh, what you'd like to do, and there's a few opportunities here with volatility. The swinging the way it is, it give you a chance to go ahead and buy something a little bit cheaper to, you know, to put your play on. And that'll give you a little bit more time to kind of uh, to watch it play out. Uh, long, there isn't really anything long term about them to kind of play right now. But I, I think that uh, uh, there is so many players in the equity market that it makes for, uh, you know, makes for a bigger playground. To participate in and in, in that and from that standpoint, you know, uh, trading in that market is big. I personally do trade in the ES market myself, uh, futures and options. Uh, just even dabbling, scalping, just to stay in it, uh, and then doing uh, doing some options plays, just kind of some short term, uh, you know, just for the week kind of thing. Because it's very difficult to try to make a long term play uh, in options uh, in a market quite like that. Yeah, equities are definitely the domain of the near-dated paper. What do we do before the rise of weeklies, Virginia? It seems like all anybody can trade in equities now is weeklies. And the notion of expiration Friday, it's kind of quaint now, Virginia. Yeah, it, it, it is. And I never would have thought that because uh, even when I did start in options uh, at, at the uh, SIBO, we only traded calls. We never even had puts. <laughs> And then it was, you know, just the just the certain expiring months. And uh, now that we've changed, then and, and every week is a is an expiration. Uh, I think it's uh, it makes uh, it, it's great, and I think that it works fantastic. And even in the bond market, when they had the flex options, and you know, there's anything that you want to do, there's a way that we can put together <laughs> we can put together a product uh, to make that trade. And what that does, that just gives everyone opportunity 
to come in and trade it. So uh, it's almost, it makes it difficult for any one person to have a handle on the whole thing. So in that way, it kind of levels the playing field as challenging as that may be. Well, let's see what's lighting it up this week. Let's hang out first in small cap land. Again, go to that drop down for equities listeners. Go to the Russell 2000. You'll see we're coming into showtime. And nets on the week is actually up, as Virginia was alluding to. We had rallies pretty much until today. Uh, 2210 is where we find ourselves now, up about 44, almost 45 handles. Nearly 2% on the week, of course, since our last show. A little bit of a different story. That's where we have uh, the Russell 2000 up about 4%. Uh, from this time last week. And of course, it's all near dated week four Aug going out tomorrow doing 33% of the paper. We won't hang our hat out there. Instead, we'll go a little bit farther out. Let's go out to September contract the monthly September. I still has about 21, almost 22 days to go. 23% of the paper going up out there. Let's see. That's if you're wondering the vol out there at about a 21. So obviously substantially below what RVX is pricing in out there. So interesting to see if RVX catches up to that or if this vol catches up more to RVX in the coming weeks. It's off about one, almost one and a quarter points this week. A skew wise, the puts last week were 17% bid. This week, 15.9%. So coming in a little bit. The calls last week, 11.7%. Cheap this week, nearly 13%. So calls getting crushed, puts getting a little bit less bid this week. And in terms of the action, you guys all want to know about Small Delta calls. Looks like a lot of the action this week was actually in a lot of puts. 2170 puts out there in September leading the dance this week. We also had 22 quarter puts, which are actually in the money puts and very high Delta right now. Also very active out here. So it looks like a tail of a lot of puts. 22 10 puts going out in the week one step contract. A lot of puts. 21 half puts going a little bit farther out in October. Pretty much all puts all the time. This week here in the Russell 2000, which is interesting. You have to look pretty far to find any calls lighting it up. And that would be in the week two SEP contract, 22 half calls. Those aren't quite exactly small delta, but they're smaller going up, but not even a ton of paper there. So mostly puts this week in the money going out this week. And of course, a little bit longer term out of the money puts in September as well. And you mentioned the ES. Let's head out there really quickly as well. Virginia. Let's go out here again. Go to that same drop down listeners. Go to the US index. Go to the E mini SP 500. I know a lot of you like to hang your hats out there as well. And the same deal here in the SP that it is in pretty much every equity these days. The lion's share of the action 26.4% in the contract that's going out tomorrow, the week four AUG contract. By the way, if you're wondering, 4471 coming into showtime here in the SP. Let's go a little bit farther out to find something. We can sink our teeth into a little bit more. Let's go out to the SEP monthly contract. It has about 21, almost 22 days to go. The vol out there, listeners, a comparatively anemic 12 and a quarter. <laughs> That's off about three quarters of a point. That kind of gets back to what we were saying. You know, the actual realized vol, how much volatility has been exhibited in the S&P these days is, is fairly anemic. So even at these middling mid to high teen ball levels for the VIX compared to realized ball, there is still a pretty hefty premium out there. So bear that in mind if you're saying, oh, this ball's here in, you know, in the teens and VIX is low. The actual ball in some of these contracts is actually a lot lower <laughs> out there in the S&P. In terms of, by the way, if you're wondering, almost 20% of the paper went up in this SEP contract this week. Skew wise, the puts were almost, <laughs> wow, this is a hefty bid, almost 30% rich to the at the money that shows you how much interest there is in these puts right now, listeners. My goodness. 30% last week and 36.7% rich. They're even more bid this week. Talking nearly a 40% premium. Granted, that at the money vol level is pretty low. So that's going to account for some of that differential. But still, that's a hefty premium for the puts, listeners. You got to really got to want it at this point. The calls last week, 18.5% cheap. This week, 20 percent cheap so calls getting cheaper puts getting more bid out here in terms of where the action was the most active contract was the 34 half put going out tomorrow with about twenty two thousand five hundred of those bad boys so those are pretty small delta puts those are oh about a thousand points almost exactly out of the money 
<laughs> be interesting to see what it would take. Powell would really have to spook some people to make those puts play out by uh, tomorrow's expiration. Right behind it, we have the 4,600 calls in September, doing about 19, almost 20,000 contracts. By the way, if you're wondering how much paper goes up in the E-mini S&P options, about 1.5 million contracts. So a pretty robust product out there. We could spend the rest of the show talking about all things e-minis but i want to make sure we get some of you folks on as well so without further ado let's get to a little bit of your futures options feedback it's time for your questions comments and insights it's time for futures options feedback submit your questions at twitter.com slash options facebook.com slash the options insider stocktwits.com slash options insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com. You can also submit your feedback via our Options Insider radio network mobile app, available for iOS, Android, and Kindle Fire devices. You can even ask your questions live via our Mixler chat room. So grab the Mixler app or just search for Options Insider at mixler.com. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com. All right, welcome to the Futures Options Feedback. This is, of course, the portion of the show where you guys take the range, your questions, your comments. Sometimes we turn that spotlight back on you in the form of our question of the week. And we have done that this week. In fact, we did it last week, too, and I want to make sure we pay that one off first, too. So really quickly, we were talking last week about volatility. We said everyone has volatility on the brain these days, but which product holds the volatility crown? We asked you, quite simply, which of these has the highest 30-day volatility? No cheating, use your gut. And we gave you four choices, Bitcoin, VIX, crude oil, or Tesla. Remember why I said earlier about VVIX? Because exactly half of you, 50% of you chose Bitcoin. And I get it. Bitcoin is kind of synonymous with volatility these days. But And only see 21.1% of you chose VIX, 15.6% of you said Tesla, 13.3% said crude oil. And the actual answer, remember, as I said earlier, that VVIX is lofty, is VIX. When we posted these, this poll last week, uh, the actual VIX 30-day at-the-money volatility was 105%. That beats Bitcoin. That was about at about an 85%. Beats Tesla was at about a 40, almost 41%. And WTI is at about a 35%. So you guys chose Bitcoin, but the answer was pretty firmly in the VIX camp. This week, we have a volatility-related question. I'd love to get your thoughts on this as well, Virginia. We're asking you this week. We said we've seen a lot of turbulence in the market recently. What do you feel is the main driver of this latest round of volatility and don't see your choice. You can always reply with your DM with your answers, alternative answers. A lot of you have done so. Uh, we gave you four choices this week, said the Delta variant, Afghanistan, the tapering concerns by the Fed, or overall general market valuation concerns. And Virginia, again, I'd be curious, get your thoughts on this. If you have a vote in this poll, have at it. And then more importantly, what do you think our audience is voting for? <laughs> Hmm, the audience. Uh, yeah, it depends on, on uh, what they're thinking. Uh, it's kind of interesting to, uh, to me. I, I would have said that it really comes down to the Delta variant and then everything else is kind of a ripple effect. Afghanistan is, you know, doesn't look good on television and maybe it might uh, pause a few people. But the Delta variant uh, as a whole, I think, is affecting not just the U.S. economically, but worldwide uh, economics. And by that, it then starts to drive a little bit of, you know, what are we going to do with inflation? What are the feds going to do? And I think that that's the, uh, the number one thing that's actually driving it. Interesting. You probably make the argument that Delta variant is some combination of most of these others, maybe outside of Afghanistan. Delta variant has something to, to do with all the rest. But right now, it's the Fed. Fed tapering concerns, 54.1% of you saying that. And you could, of course, argue that one of the main Fed concerns is the Delta variant. So it's kind of hard to divorce these. In fact, many of you have written in saying we should have an all of the above choice. And yeah, I wish if, if Twitter allowed us to have you know more than four choices, probably would have put that in there as well, even though it's a bit of a, of a cop out. I want you guys to choose uh, this week. So 54.1% of you saying it's the Fed, 20.4% saying the Delta variant. So lower for the Delta variant than I may have thought. 14.3% saying it's valuation concerns and 112 so far weighing in for Afghanistan. You got about 24 hours or so to get in on this one at options over there on Twitter to make your voice heard. 
Well, let's have a couple of questions here from you guys. You already snuck Nichols in already with the fires question. A lot of Z handles today. Meets with a Z. He wants to know, what's the deal with the FX complex? Uh, why does it do so little volume? Yeah, you know, we just talked about it earlier in the show there, Meets. We had the peso on our dark side movers and shakers. The first time we've seen FX on our movers and shakers in forever. So I was hoping to be able to squeeze it in today, but it did 215 contracts this week. And that's kind of emblematic of most of the FX complex. You get outside of Euro USD, Pound USD, a few of those kind of big dogs over there. The volume really falls off of a cliff. And part of that has to do with the fact that the volatility out there, I mean, outside of you have these crazy black swan events every now and then, like the Swiss Franc and a few others that kind of drive a lot of headlines and Brexit a bit as well. But outside of that, there isn't really a lot of volatility to be found in the FX space. So as a result, you know, volatility is kind of the lifeblood of options trading. If you don't have a ton of vol, then it's hard to really uh, drive a lot of options stories for traders and narratives out there. And so as a result, it doesn't really translate. And of course, for a lot of the audience of this show who are coming in on the retail front, a lot of these FX products, you know, in terms of the spreads and what's driving them and, and you know, triple spreads and things like that's a little bit obtuse for them. They have a hard time sinking their teeth into that as well. It's easier for them to understand, let's say, a WTI and an OPEC and that relationship versus what's driving the peso versus the dollar right now. It's a little bit more opaque for them. So I think it's a combo of those two things. And that's unfortunately, I wish I wish we could squeeze more FX in. There just isn't a lot of really stories to, to parse there. I wish there were. And that, last up here, we've got Alan here, Virginia. First off, if you have anything to add on the FX option space, why it doesn't do any paper, have at it. And then B, Alan wants to know, is there one ag that you feel is most appropriate for new players in that market? We get this question a lot, the, you know, the new entrance question. So if you have an ag to recommend for Alan as well, Virginia, have at it. Well, I'll say one thing about the uh, about the FX uh, options market. It's really a boutique options market. And that's where even in lumber, it's the same kind of thing. It was a boutique market. You didn't even think about lumber until you had this issue. And at some point in time, that's going to go back down and go back into the closet <laughs> uh, for a while once things get to settle down. And that's exactly what's happening in, in FX. And I think in the grain market, the one market that uh, as a new trader to get involved in would be the corn market, just because it's just more fluid. There's just much more participation and uh, it helps you in, in case you get stuck into something. There's always someone to take you out of it uh, without completely, you know, uh, taking your entire your entire account uh, account down. So I would always tell everyone to get get involved in the corn side because um, it's uh, it's fluid all the way through into short dated options uh everything there's always something to trade in it and i think that it's the it's kind of the leader of the market too it's such a behemoth of the of the grain market that that's really the one to participate in i can't argue with any of that well said corn is definitely uh, the go-to does the most paper at about three hundred thirty-six thousand contracts right now she mentioned also some volatility to be found so all of you out there in the equity landscape maybe you're saying oh this s p vols a 12 what am i going to do with that well corn vol right now at around a 30 depending on where you're looking that front contract about a 31 and a half you get a little bit farther out you get to about 25 and a half to the 28 or so you get out to you know october november that time frame uh, so a little bit more vol to be found. And as Virginia mentioned, a little bit of liquidity. So if you are intrigued, just remember, the skew is going to be a different beast in the ags than it is in your equities. But if you can wrap your head around that, you could do worse than uh, at least keeping an eye on and maybe dipping a toe in to the corn market. But that music means, unfortunately, we are done for another week here on Twifo. Of course, we'll be back at you tomorrow, noon central. 1 p.m. Eastern for Vol Views, and of course, after that for Options Oddities. But before we go, let's go back around the horn. Virginia did an able job filling in on the hot seats again today. If folks are intrigued, they want to reach out to you, ask questions about ags or any other markets, where should they go? What should they do? Well, they should go to virginiamcgaffey.com, and uh, I will be there to answer it. Put your questions in there, and I'll uh, get back to you on them. There you go, Virginia McGathy. That's M C G A T H E Y 
Ag.com is the place to go for your questions on ags and everything else under the sun. Lumber, feel the dreams you want to know. Hit her up, VirginiaMcGaffey.com. You know where to go for all these reports we're talking about here throughout the show. CMEGroup.com slash Twifo or slash Twio. Again, these reports are not just live during showtime. They're live all week long. If you want to check the corn reports at, let's say, Friday at 3 a.m., no one's going to judge. Head on out. It's live. You can check it out for yourselves over there. CMEGroup.com slash Twifo. And, of course, you know where to go for all this data we're talking about on small cap volatility, small cap versus is large cap impact of the Delta variant on volatility and a whole bunch more. FTSERussell.com. FTSERussell.com is the place to go. Give them a follow on the old Twitter while you're at it. At FTSE Russell is the place to go. We got to go on out of here. We'll be back again tomorrow, noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern for volatility views. And then for all you folks in the secret club, 2 p.m. Central, 3 p.m. Eastern for options oddities. And we're back again next week with another episode of This Week in Futures Options. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 Futures and Options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME Group. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com, CBOE.com, and CMEGroup.com. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rule book of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com.